And I, if I had one tip to tell people, it would say, you know, look for where people walk and the insides of bends and, and hunt those. You don't, if you're going to find a really big fish, you know, hunt, hunt the water that nobody's hunting. Frog water and, and we could do it. We could do two hours on just water, I can assure you. And it would be contrary to everything anyone's ever said. That was Kelly Gallup talking about where he finds large fish and why so many people miss the mark. Let's get ready to rumble. This is the 52nd episode in our first full year of the podcast. Let's try that again. Let's get ready to rumble. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. In today's episode, I interview Kelly Gallup, the guy who literally wrote the book on modern streamer fly fishing. We talk about how he rotates through his flies quickly while fishing, while he never swings tail first, and how to jig a fly. We get into the most common misnomers in fly fishing and talk about why we need to think about trout as sharks, and also about the 50 great fly fishers. Don't miss this one as Kelly finally tells us whether he was really a porn star back in the 1970s. Before I get into the episode today, I wanted to take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. The Gray Drake produces beautiful vintage fly boxes and wallets that are handmade in the USA, made with sustainable cork, reducing environmental impacts, and still providing for the highest quality product. A portion of all proceeds go to local fish conservation projects. Go to thegraydrake.com to get started today. We are also brought to you by Ascent Fly Fishing, who has a special event during the holiday season called Fishmas. You get 25 to 75% off all flies in select categories during each of the 12 days of Fishmas. There are still a few days left of this holiday special, so go to ascentflyfishing.com to find out more. So, without further ado, here's Kelly Gallup from slidein.com. How's it going, Kelly? Good, Dave. How you doing? Good. I, I'm glad to have you on here. We've uh, been trying to get you on here for quite a while. I've got a bunch of big questions for you on, uh, you know, mainly streamer fishing, and I hope uh, we can jump into that. Maybe you can start us off with a little background. I know you've done this before, but just a little bit about how you got into mm-hmm. fly fishing and how you got to where you are today. Mm, I got into fly fishing when I was very young. My dad was a guide in 1940. He was the first guide on the Pier Marquette, actually, in Michigan. And I just, you know, like anybody else, I started tying and fishing. I started tying for local fly shops, I think, when I was 13. And well, they weren't really fly shops. They were they were more interesting back then. They were they were bait shops. They had minnow tanks and night crawlers and all that kind of stuff in them. Someplace in there, you might find a box of flies. So it wasn't like a big time fly shops. But uh, you started guide when I was 15. 16 and basically did that you know pretty much went full-time with my fly stuff fly fly shops uh about well i started one out of my house i think in 79 or right around there and then went full-time a year or two later and the rest is history Hmm. just been doing it ever since then and started writing for fly fishermen in the 80s and different stuff, the TV shows and stuff like that. It just kind of went along over the next 40 years or so. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I know there's a ton of content that I'm not going to be able to get into today. I know Gene Herring, I had him on an earlier episode, and we talked about, you know, talked about the stuff he produced with you, and I've got a couple of your videos mm-hmm. here on uh, some of your stuff. So, yeah, there's lots of good stuff. I think I'll just provide links in the show notes for this one for people that want to look up some of your older stuff. I, I would like to get into a little bit on the history there because, um, you know, I'm just trying to document where we came from, you know, back in the streamer game Mm -hmm. into where we are now. And I know you were a big player in changing things up. Can you talk about like go old school for us, like back in whatever old school is to you 
and then talk about that transition where uh, something happened with streamers. Can you explain that? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it's a crazy deal. I mean, because streamer fishing has been around for, you know, thousands of years, obviously. I mean, people have been throwing things out, but to say it was really a game, uh, it really didn't start no matter, I mean, no matter when you say this, I'm like, oh, I was doing that before you were born. I said, yeah, shit, everybody, everybody's done everything. But really, if you look back in time before Bob and I wrote Modern Streamers, uh, you would have to go, it would be pretty hard to find somebody that was dedicated to fly fishing streamers. And I mean, I think a lot of us, like I did, I started out, and a lot of us a European influence with the wet fly swing, uh, traditional wet fly swing. And then, you know, we, then, then the, along comes selective trout and trout strategies and everybody's going into this super hatch matching and, and technical dry stuff. And I was the same way. I, you know, I started out as a, we started out swinging wet flies, you know, maybe you'd throw a streamer would be like a, a big streamer back in the day would be like a, you know, a Mickey Finn or a, yeah. people called muddlers. You need, need people to have these size, you know, 10 muddler and call it a streamer. But for the most part, we, I think we swung flies more than we did anything. And then that the, the then the no hackle phase came along and all that. And that really put a backseat to everything subsurface, if you ask me. Even in Michigan where we, you know, that's where I grew up. And it was, everybody got into that dry fly thing. And then it goes and it goes and it goes and everybody's out west. And, you know, there's, and we're starting to move around in the 80s. But it really wasn't until we wrote Modern Streamers that, uh, that I saw a real influx of dedicated streamer guys. And the only reason I did it is I get, we just didn't have great hatches in Michigan in the daytime. And we you know we fished Spinner Falls more than anything. My, my second book, which I probably should have wrote first was cause I wouldn't be quite so pigeonhole because, uh, you know, I'm known as a streamer guy, but I've yep. probably got more dries and nymphs than I do nationally than I do streamers. But, hmm. and that's what I did. I was a streamer or, I mean, I was a steelhead and dry fly guy for the most part but somewhere in there right right if you look back before the book came out you'll see that in any catalog it's hard to find more than five streamers <laughs> and they would classify a gray ghost a mickey finn a black nose dace uh a muddler maybe um you know there was there was a handful but it was pretty hard to find any real flies and so then that's, you know, for me, how it started was I just got really kind of bored of uh, attractor fishing and, and the lack of hatches. And basically, it was looking for something different. And I happened to see a, a show once with a guy, Larry Nixon, one of the best bass anglers. I'm a, I love bass fishing. I, I like all kinds of fishing. I'm not fly only, but... Mm -hmm. um, but I watched him, and he, he did his thing on it. Uh, it's reactionary bites, and it was about walking the dog, which is a topwater bait where you you walk it, you kind of pop its head back and forth on the surface. And he mentioned how it was you made how you made fish react to the lure, and I thought that was kind of contrary to common knowledge because he said when the fish were set up in dour, which means they're temperature related, push them down and they made the fish eat it, and I <laughs> thought that was pretty cool. And then I went out and tried it, and it actually worked, and so, uh, for trout, you know, and so the rest is kind of history. It was just kind of, uh, I was also getting bored with salmon fishing, so I <laughs> explained to all my customers that uh, we were going to, anybody that wanted to keep fishing with me, we were going to, they were going to be my guinea pigs. <laughs> we were going to fish my way, my way only. We were going to experiment. We no more. We weren't going to fish dries or wets or nymphs. Sorry about that little oh, dog in uh, squeaky door. <laughs> but uh, I was going to. That's what we did. And so yeah. the transition started then. And if you look at it uh, back then, we weren't even into the articulated flies. And so. We we tried to actually stop the book, 
because we realized that the flies were that we hadn't really started fishing articulated flies, which by today's listener, most people don't realize there's an era where we didn't have those. Yeah. I mean, I have kids all the time coming in. I mean, kids mean under 40, 35, 40, that don't even recall the flies. We brought all the classics in this uh, two years ago, classics being like a Royal Coachman and a <laughs> Grey Ghost and stuff like that. And it's amazing how many people don't even realize it. Some of them think they're new. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> it's like, well, no, it wasn't always this articulated stuff. And huh. I, when, the, when the zoo cougar, which was my first really big national fly, streamer-wise, came out, people would always walk in and be like, oh, what the hell is that? Are you going to fish pike with that? Is that a <laughs> tarpon fly? And Sweet. By today's standards, it's like a quarter or a half of a fly. Yeah. You know, but back then... So that's basically the transition. And, and, you know, then we had dedicated lines and, Hmm. you know, we, things just started changing as we started getting companies to design lines. Jim Teeny and I worked out the first one together and that was a, that was a pretty good step forward because it showed the manufacturers that people actually were doing this. It, it took me years to get somebody to build a rod and because they really didn't buy into it. They, the, hmm. the manufacturers and the companies really didn't buy into people who were going to do this streamer thing. They did. Yeah, so they eventually did. How how long did it take until they bought into it? Mm, well, you know, like anything, money started ruling. When modern streamers came out and it was such a huge success, uh, for sales wise, it didn't take long when that, when that book was selling pretty rapid fire and it was probably three years later after it was released. And then of course, Gene and I were doing things, Herring Mm -hmm. at Flyfish TV. And then, you know, when you start, it was mostly they, people started realizing, I would say three years before the companies. But, you know, the rod companies until St. Croix decided to do it and dedicate up, you know, an actual rod, what I would hear constantly was, well, why don't you just use this one? And I'd say, well, because it's not really good for what I'm doing. (laughs) And and then you'd hear the guy and say, well, this isn't like fishing in the flats or here. I mean, we fit, we cast so much and you need a rod made for it to do that. And so it took a long time. I mean, it, it took it took years. It took, you know, a tribe to make it happen. Mm-hmm. You had to get a bunch of people behind you. Mm. And, you know, people started seeing more and more people ask for, do you have a rod for this? And, you know, the shops across the country start going, hey, we're getting asked for this all the time. Can we? And eventually they, they just said, yeah, go. Mm. Nice, nice. Yeah, I want to get more into the the rods and the flies. And you have uh, all the, the porn names, right, for your flies, or mm-hmm. some of that stuff. But uh, before I get there, maybe you could talk a little bit about the, um, you know, just uh, big versus small fish. Because I know that's a, a question some people have about, you know, is it are we talking just big fish here? Are we talking small fish? And where do you use those flies? Can you talk a little bit about that as far as, sure. you know, somebody that's maybe new to it? Well, you know, the first thing about it is it, it does not preclude just hunting big fish. Uh, I, I was just, you know, I, I wrote Modern Streamers 2, and I, I, it's been a tragedy of errors here uh, getting it to the press. But uh, I was just talking to Jerry Dennis, who's editing it, and, you know, I, there were some comments in there that I made that he thought were kind of different. But one of them was that no one can target big fish. And you truly can't. I mean, you, you would like to think, and I, and I know lots of people with egos the size of Montana would like to say they do, and you can target them. That doesn't mean you can make that happen always. But in the, in the, in the chase, it does not preclude you from catching small fish because trout are predators, and they start being a predator virtually at birth. I have photographs of fry eating fry hmm. in, in tanks. And so my theory is always that a fish eats half its body length as often as possible. 
And so, but I have, like I said, I have photographs from planting trucks when they, you've got fry with another fry in its mouth. You've got par with par in their mouth. And so it happens very young. I've got pictures of uh, <clears throat> fish that are, I don't, I, I don't probably don't have more than a dozen, but fish that are under 10 inches that have flies that are eight inches long. <laughs> You know, yep. and 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 that that's just the way it is. So it's not really going to stop you from catching little fish. Uh, I mean, my my manager Johnny does it all the time, <laughs> and so. <laughs> but uh, they, it it, a lot of people think that's going to and and to the converse of that. You know, I just like to make one address. It's starting to go backwards, but. For a while there, there was this thing about big flies were going to catch big fish. Yeah. And I don't believe that's true necessarily. I mean, a bigger fly will help elicit a strike out of something that doesn't want to eat. But just because the fly is big doesn't mean you are hunting big fish only. I've had this discussion with a lot of people who are on the river. I'm like, dude, you're going to take that. I switch my flies. It's virtually impossible to get me to keep a fly on for five minutes because mm-hmm. I'm trying to get through my rotation. But I'll see these mm-hmm. people with one fly, and their comment is always, well, I'm looking for the one. Right. And I said, so, well, you think the one is dumber than hell and he's going to eat it because nothing else has? <laughs> I don't get that theory. Just because it's giant, you're going to think that's going to make that fish eat? Right. And and I don't really necessarily believe that to be true. I think there's a point where the flies, it's hard to elicit a strike out of a giant fish with too small of a fly. But if you keep in that mid zone, that three to five and a half, six inch fly, you you have I think just as good a chance at eliciting a strike out of a thirty inch fish as you do out of a ten inch fish. Okay. I okay. mean, so you know you can you're going to get, and that's one of the most common things I get when people respond to something to me or they're emailing me is they can't, they started the, the streamer game and they're going out down the river where somebody's told them I have fished all over the world. And no matter where I've been, people have told me they don't eat streamers here, <laughs> including the white river for the first 20 years I fished it. Some really good anglers told me they don't eat them there. Even though Dave Whitlock had been doing it since the seventies, I don't know why they didn't believe them, but I had people, I had fly shops tell me they wouldn't eat streamers on the way. <laughs> and 20 years before the whole streamer love fest and this giant event that's happened down there, they were eating them fine. But same on the Madison, same on the Delaware. I mean, I'd hear it constantly like their fish were different than, but I, I think what it was, people were just, they just didn't want to change. Yeah. And they didn't want to see the, the trend Traditional. change, especially, well, the dry fly guys in particular, which I am one. I mean, like I said, my second book's a totally techy dry fly book. Huh. And, you know, it's, but it's, it's just one of those things where it's people, when they write in, they would say to me, you know, I, I went out and I can't believe how many fish I saw in the river that I thought, you know, weren't there or, man, I thought I was just going to be looking for one fish and I went out and I caught 20 fish in a day and, you know, from six inches to 16 or 20 or whatever. And, but that's just because they're predators. They're just, they are triggered to do what, trained to do what they do in the brain and they do it, Yeah, you know? And so cool. it's not, it's not stopping you from catching all sizes. No. Okay. Yeah. Those are great. Uh, it's good stuff. It just brings up more questions and um, that I'll hopefully be able to get in here. Uh, but yeah, you know, Gary Borger was on in a past episode, episode 45, and kind of a similar deal. You know, he was there in the, the nymph while you were there too, you know, in the change where nymphing got kind of going more and sound like the same thing happened there where people just weren't doing it. They were kind of just dry fly fishing. It's almost like you weren't a real fisherman um, unless you Oh, were. you were, yeah, you were <laughs> looking, same thing with the, the nymph was the same thing. I mean, there were shops that didn't sell nymphs in the wow. 80s. And, uh, I mean, Gates Asaba Lodge, Rusty Gates, who's passed now, but uh, I, that's, I used to hang out over there quite a bit. And he just, he did, I think there was a point where he wouldn't sell one. 
<laughs> I mean, but I mean that's kind of the birthplace of you know selective trout and all that stuff. So oh. it was really a dry fly river. But and, and like I said earlier, I, I grew up with a wet fly swing. Uh, you know, my first fly rod was a nine foot cane rod, and and basically some old. I didn't fish silk much. That we fished floating lines even then, but but they were all wore out. We just swing wet flies, right? Yep. And that was okay, but when you put a split shot, there was, this is long before bead heads when we started nymphing. There, that was something that Roman Mauser started, uh, and it, the, the bead head craze. But mm-hmm. but there there you were serious. I still hear it to this day, which I personally think the most technical uh, and what needs the most skill, personally, I think, is still the, uh, nymph fishing. But to do it well. But you still to this day here, well, anybody can nymph fish. I said, really? Let's go fishing. Yeah. Because to dumb it down and pretend that anybody can do anything is, is wrong. I mean, and who cares? It's just, but it's the same thing. Like, it's the same transition just 10 years uh, past, you know, what the nymph thing was. And it's still to this day a little bit. There's places where, I mean, you go in and throw down on a, a legit, you know, if you go in and start nymphing rivers, there's places where people still give you the skunk eye. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I guess that's uh, well, well. We'll hopefully uh, talk a little bit about the ego uh, stuff and all that. It's, I, I think that's kind of a funny part too. I've I've been around fly fishing for a long time as well, so I I love hearing uh, more of the background. But um, before we jump in there, maybe we can just go back to like. You know, square one, as far as streamers, can you describe, uh, you know, maybe talk about your home river and how you catch fish with streamers and maybe think about somebody who's maybe new to it out there and just doesn't know anything, is just getting started, and explain what you're trying to do out there. Well, my home rivers, if you went to the beginning, would be Michigan, and uh, I live in Montana now, and let me just reemphasize that there's no difference between your river and my river, no matter where you are. Um, you know, New Zealand to here to Alaska, I don't really care. It's all the same. And what I look for, I mean, how it, what it changed is what the big change would happen when, when we started doing this was we, I no longer, and I said, like I said, it's a perfect show to say this because I don't swing a fly ever. Yeah. I, I do some videos. I did some about uh, trout spay and this, and I get all these guys mad at me because they're saying, well, you can do this with anything. Said, that's true. You can. You can do anything. But the way we fish our flies and what changed from what had always been done in the past is that I never swing a fly tail first. Hmm. I never passively swing a streamer to a trout. That never is a big word. It doesn't. It Obviously, on occasion, yeah. I'll see something I want to, there are mornings, there are specific zones and times when I will, uh, in the mornings when there's a lot of fry in a system, in the spring in particular, uh, when I know there's fish hunting bait balls and stuff like that, then I might do it, but it's really rare. Most of what we do is a right angle to the flow. And so perpendicular to the flow, cross across stream and the head comes straight across or slightly down and on a fast retrieve. Hmm. And not all, and that's not true. Faster than what a swing would be. But we don't always go fast. I probably jig a fly, having it go up and down and kind of rhythmically and not necessarily hauling as much as I do uh, really fast stuff. But the very beginning, the, the, the start, was that we were going across stream and we were coming perpendicular to the flow and we were moving the fly much faster than historically had been done. And we were creating that reactionary bite as opposed to a food-based only bite, which a swing is more inclined to create. And so the swing was a passive thing and the the jerk strip is what the first one was called. And that was because of everybody says, well, you're really lucky. You got a, you got a retrieve named after you, <laughs> but I named it the jerk strip because of Larry Nixon working a jerk bait. Uh-huh. And if I hadn't seen Larry doing that TV show, we wouldn't be talking right now because that's what made me go out and try that stuff. And so 
And I realized that I was triggering this response out of the trout and it wasn't just a food based thing. And so the different, you know, how I address the fish, any river, I just answered this email this morning on a, on a YouTube comment thing is how do you address it in the East or the West? And there's no difference. I address the river as, as a, a, all rivers are being equal. They all have their own little nuances for sure. But I go in back to that home water and, and roots of that stuff is I, I start by getting to see if I can get the fish to respond to the reactionary stuff. And that's by the perpendicular yep. that, that going across stream. If that doesn't work almost immediately, the first thing I do is change my, re, my rhythm, you know, my, the cadence of the retrieve. And so it's really fast to start with. I, I like to start fast simply because the reactionary bite is so cool. It is so fast, so cool, and there's just nothing that can compete with that. Excuse me one second. Yeah. Squeaky door and a puppy that keeps asking to go in. Yeah, there you go. I need a dog training class. But <laughs> so the, the reactionary thing is the fun part. You know, that's the difference between, you know, it's just cool. Yeah. And so, but basically that's the real difference is that, you know, we're going to, that's where the roots of it, how it started was the, the perpendicular to the flow retrieve. And after that, lots of things changed. Okay. You know, that's when all the other retrieves came into Gotcha. Effect. Gotcha. And so when you're fishing this thing, um, I mean, I guess that's another whole another question is finding the fish. But once you kind of have an area that you're you're kind of uh, covering, and, and how do you get that head-on, um, you know, that head-on movement to the fish? How are you, you know? Well, it's, yeah. it's going across streams. So it's going across them, you know. Uh, so I'm, stro- I'm throwing straight across, not up. I'm, I might throw up just a little bit, but... If the head's coming across stream directly at you, not so it's going straight across the fish's head. Oh, I see. And so, or slightly down, you know, yeah. I, I like both, but not the traditional where you would throw down and across. I'm throwing straight across. I see. And so the, I don't like the tails. To me, a tail going to a fish, first of all, your prey items don't swim backwards. A, a, a trout do not swim backwards. They might... <laughs> float backwards like on a feed zone where they're kind of getting pushed back but they don't float down river backwards and i tell people this a lot it's like a lion it's like a gazelle backing his ass into a lion's mouth it just doesn't happen you know they know they're on the food chain in a certain area and so you need to have your eyes open they don't go backwards and so and and there's there would be a lot less room for that triggering that reactionary bite or a predatory response by something that's just slowly come. Does that mean they don't eat it? That Yes, they do. I've caught thousands of fish swinging flies, did it most of my adult life, but not nearly the number and not nearly the size that I do when I get to do multiple trigger zones, which is that reactionary bite where you're fleeing, you know, you're, you're hitting and running, which is triggering one response. You're invading that fish's spot, which is not good in a predatory world. If people would quit thinking about trout as trout and start thinking them as sharks or bears or <laughs> mountain lions, they'd have a lot better idea because a predator is a predator. Yeah. You trigger that response, something's going to happen. Mm-hmm. The fish has got, you know. And so what we're doing is we're looking for multiple trigger or reactionary things, and you do it all in the same retrieve, then hence your fly and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, yeah. but that's the whole point of it. So you're coming across the fish, short windows, and probably, <clears throat> you know, trying to get the fly to invade the space and run away from the space. Like, you know, whoops, shouldn't yep. have been here and then run. Hmm. And are you, so, as far as the water you're, you're targeting, are you kind of fishing just tor- uh, typical trout water? Are you going for deeper stuff, shallower stuff? What, what type of, how are you finding those fish? That, that's a great question because it's, you know, while I was writing these books uh, previous to that, when I, I used to dive a lot and I dove the rivers a lot. And this was probably the most important thing I learned in all of us, all this journey 
it's more about where the fish aren't than where they are. And it's the hardest thing to unlearn is that really big, and that's the difference between targeting big fish and targeting all fish. Really big fish seldom hang in water that we would consider a feeding zone. They like to stop. They're, like, they're more often on the insides of the bends than the outsides, the really juicy looking stuff. I would say 99% of the people walk through the big fish every single day. Yep. They, they, they're on the insides, generally on parallel color changes where you got a long like stripe on the inside where two different bottom materials meet. And all of my diving, which was hundreds of hours, uh, and basically all I would do is when I first started diving, I did it in the late 70s and early 80s, and it was because of I was still completely on the dry fly game, just starting to play into the nymph game a little bit. And I had read Gary LaFontaine's book, and I really, one of Gary's books, and talking about how bugs hatched and the whole sparkle pupa era coming into B. And I was like, man, this guy is so full of it. He has, this guy's just making this. So I started <laughs> diving to see if he was right. The first thing I realized is he was probably about 40 years ahead of his time and possibly one of the smartest anglers that ever lived. Yeah. And the second thing I realized is that I, I, when I was trying to get from one good spot to the other, that's how it happened. This wasn't by design. And, and it really didn't stick in my brain. In the early days, I thought it was just a fluke. But I would cut corners on rivers to get to some other spot quicker, and I would spook fish. You know, I'd come around the corner like, oh, there's a fish. Oh, my God. What's wrong with him? Hmm. And, hmm. you know, because he's not where he belongs. Like between, so, between the pools you were trying to really survey. Yeah, exactly. Or the riffles or, you know, a lot of, especially in the early days, I was looking for water that would that would hold caddis and, you know, and there's only certain times of the day you'd see him and, and stuff like that. But as I started to search out for the, uh, the diving, looking for the trout, which happened before I wrote the book, when I, the, the whole thing with the Larry Nixon, I, I tied up a fly, uh, and I went out to try to see if I could make a, a jerk bait fly. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and so I was trying to work it and I got one of my biggest fish ever. And so, and it was the middle of the day, middle of July, or July 9th, actually, and like 2.30 in the afternoon. Well, I had zero intent on actually catching a fish. I was just trying to, I was killing time. You know, I was just like, wow, this will, wonder if this will work. And I got this big fish, and I, I, then I went back and I dove that stretch of river. And what I found was there were a lot of big fish in the river I didn't realize and so, but they seem to be in the wrong places. And so when I started diving, it started telling me where these fish were. I'd see a fish here and I didn't see tons of fish. It's not like I saw thousands of fish, you know, dozens maybe um, of really big fish that, you know, fish over 26, seven inches. And, and so what happened was when I started diving, I realized everything not only that the fish ate the fly that I'd thrown out, which wasn't really a topwater fly. It was just underneath the water, but it was too big. The fly was too big. It was moving too fast. I didn't put these parts together for a while, frankly. And then I went out and dove this stretch of the Boardman River in Traverse City, and I saw two or three other really big fish, which big being over, you know, in that two-foot range and which is a giant fish mm -hmm. no matter where you are that this thing about two footers being common is so bs yeah <laughs> we were gonna i was gonna make a t-shirt last year it says 17 the new 23 <laughs> uh two foot's huge and yeah. so but anyway what i found was that the really big fish uh were almost always in open co not near cover which is the hardest thing as mm -hmm. i told you my dad was a guy in 1940 and I, I learned to fish with him and other guys and and everything I'd ever taught was log jams and deep yep. undercuts and deep pools. I never found a big fish in deep water. Almost every fish I found uh, or have caught have been less than three foot of water, which people all, you know, I grew up bait fishing and everything. You go into the big pools and you, but you get your fish at the tail outs on the edges, but not at the bottom. And of all my diving that hundreds of hours, I never saw one down there, ever. 
Hmm. Now, I'd see uh, in certain rivers, I'd see black striped suckers, not very often, never a carp, nothing that would wanted to be in cooler water, occasionally a walleye, but never did I see anything that was a, a big trout. And so where those fish are is, you know, you, you can throw your fly to the same water. And if you've never pushed or seen or got a big fish out of it, after a while, it should tell you something. I mean, because your ego is taking you to those uh, places where we've been taught, you know, the feeding zones and the and the the deep pools. Yeah. Now, I get that question constantly. How do I get down to these deep pools? Hmm. A fish, uh, personally, I think if you had a fish that had a, a 10-foot hole and it was in it, I don't think you could make it eat a night crawler. No. They're, when they set up in that kind of water, uh, they're just dour. They're yeah. just sitting there, and it's virtually impossible to get them to move. And so, bait, I mean, that's probably, I probably get asked that question second <laughs> only to the one that I'm going to get in a minute. But the second most common question I'm, I get is, you know, how do I get down to those fish? Right. And I say, you don't. You stay above them. They're ambush fish. They're not made to eat deep. Hmm. And they're, they ambush their food. And so it's more about learning where those fish are. And I, if I had one tip to tell people, it would say, you know, look for where people walk and the insides of bends and, and hunt those. You don't, if you're going to find a really big fish, mm-hmm. you know, hunt, hunt the water that nobody's hunting. Frog water and, and we could do it. We could do two hours on just water, I can assure yeah. you. And it would be contrary to everything anyone's ever said. Mm. And, but it's just a matter of knowing where those really big fish are. Gotcha. Getting to go is a whole other world. But so, so, <laughs> so, so in a nutshell, you know, fish, probably people need to start thinking about fishing water. They, they probably aren't tar- Well, it's the same when you look at steelhead yeah. fishing too, you know, with steelhead people, a lot of times don't realize it, but you can catch huge fish within 20 feet of the bank, you know, and people, yeah. are, people are doing the, uh, hero casting, trying to cast as far as they can. But, uh, yeah, I, yeah. when the spay world showed up on steelhead, it was, you know, that, yep. which personally, I think Walt Grau from Michigan started that whole thing. And you, you, if you look in that first, and that was my other passion. I mean, I was as bad with that. I'd, oh, with steelhead? Was, oh, my God. That's all I did most oh, cool. of my life. <laughs> and, and then, you know, started doing the dry, the whole BC thing back 30 years ago and spent 20 years chasing that around. Huh. And, and and then, I mean, back in the day when I would go fish in BC with the guys, there was the only guy that was throwing a two-handed rod in that era. There was no one in the U.S. doing it. Never saw one. Look at the tapes. Go back in the 80s, Lonnie Waller and all the stuff. There was no two-handers. Walt Grau, 1983, was doing it on the PM. And But other than that, I mean, I fished with all those guys, Harry Lemire and all those guys up in the D.C. And Mike Craig's one of my best friends. I mean, and I remember the first, Mike Maxwell on the bulk was the only guy doing it. And Harry Amir did it a little bit, mostly single hand spay. But I remember when it started and I went, oh, sweet. These guys are leaving all these fish on the inside. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Uh, you know? Yeah. But it's the same with us. It's the same thing. And that's, that's where I told you I get in trouble with these guys that want to, throw that when I said that you can throw the spay, but it's not necessarily the best tool because I, I told you one way we fish is a cross stream. If I'm not fishing a cross stream, frankly, most of the time I'm fishing straight upstream huh. and I seldom fish more than 30 feet for myself because I dissect the water. As I said earlier, where they are on the insides, which would make for a bad swing. And it would also, they're on a parallel color change. They're, they're looking to just rest. And so this, that water <clears throat> is better fished tight with really short retrieves. And you, you establish, you know, that one parallel color change, that one bucket that's maybe got that just a little bit of break for that. Basically, they're predators sitting there being fat and lazy. Yeah. And so that's what you're looking for, you know. And so a lot of that has to do with, you know, where the fish the, the type of water has to do with how we find them, that softer water. 
and then once you've found the fish, you elicit the strike. Gotcha. And, and you know, are you it's typically, the same thing. Are you typically working your way uh, upstream as you're fishing? You know, I do, although I hate it because I'm inherently lazy. Uh, I hate walking upstream. Yeah. But I do, and the Madison in particular, which is a fast river, right? This is the, the, called the 50-mile riffle. Hmm. And so that's the name of the Madison River, river coined by, you know, I don't know if it was Charlie Brooks or Joe Brooks yeah. or one of the Brooks guys. Hmm said it way back when because it's just a never-ending riffle and that's my home water now and so here and again not wanting to swing the fly so much at a fish and i'm going across i end up wading straight upstream and frankly i did it back east too you know you're fishing upstream and you're you are <clears throat> straight up and then looking for that that perfect water out from it given that i could be in the middle of the river and fish to the bank i would mm. but this river uh you better be seven foot tall and weigh at least 400 pounds because you aren't getting out in it. <laughs> and so gotcha. you know it's just too fast but we do a lot of in smaller creeks and you know rivers smaller drainages i do it on foot up straight upstream same thing. And then I just look for those good spots. If I can get out in it, great. If I can't, I'm straight up. Okay. Okay. And what's a typical, when you make that cast, you find your water, you know, you've got fish, you've hooked fish there before. What is, you mentioned one, the jerk uh, retrieve, or maybe you can jerk. talk about, yeah, the jerk strip, maybe some other mm -hmm. type of uh, strips or retrieves that people might do to uh, maybe change up. Because it sounds like that's what you're always doing is constantly changing your strips or your, your weights of your flies I and things like that. I am retrieve, changing the retrieve frequently through the day. I've got, uh, on the fly, I have a rotation that I do, and I've got some rules that are kind of just everything's fluid, you know, that can change. But uh, I, I seldom, on rivers I know well, I might make 10 cat. On this river, it has such a high fish count that uh, if I, I go by color first. That's my first thing is I... I hold it with a color. Five minutes is a long time. You know, just get in the fish to respond. I've got to see the fish roll on it, right? And if it, or, or move to it in some way, that's enough. But, you know, it doesn't have to eat the fly. So I go, just for, you know, argument's sake, it's a bright day, start bright fly. But you, you can do it however you want. But I go white, black, tan, olive, yellow, chartreuse is my, kind of my basic rotation. And I never hold for more than five minutes until, and if, once they start responding now into your retrieves, if I see a fish roll at it, but doesn't commit to it, then I change the cadence of my retrieve. So if my retrieve was really slow, I would then go really quick. Right. And so, or if it was static going across like a jerk strip, which is kind of a straight across impulsy thing. Not necessarily fast, it's just a start-stop, start set. It's a planned set of stalls is what it is. You jerk the rod to move the fly hard, right, to make it poof, move, and then you stall the fly, and then you jerk the rod again and you stall it, And which is really, it's, it's, it's the best slow retrieve there is, but it's also, you know, the best fast retrieve. You cannot work a fly, animate a fly slowly by stripping the hand. You've got to do it with your rod. If you just pull on it real soft, it doesn't do anything to the fly. Mm -hmm. if you'd have to be in the water to understand. I mean, you'd have to see that. People think, well, I'll just pull it slow and it'll move the fly. It doesn't really do anything. It's surface tension on your line and the things that are, are fighting you that are different than sitting in a pool. And, but at right. any rate, you go, you go with the retrieve. And then the next one that I do, which I probably jig a fly, you know, if I'm... It, Jigging it being, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lift the rod tip just like I would a jerk strip. You pull low to the water. When you jerk fly, when you're working a fly fast, you keep your rod tip really close to the water. You jerk away from the fly, strip the excess, jerk away from the fly. That gives you this over-accentuated pump to the fly. Head will kind of curve, you know, in two directions. It'll come at you, and it'll, it's so over-accelerated, it'll either turn upstream or downstream, whichever, it depends on how you pulled on it. But then if I go, so let's say that I went through the rotation 
and I decided, okay, I was fishing really fast. Now they're responding to the color, but they're just kind of whew, giving me drive-bys, right? Mm-hmm. Then I slow my retrieve. And when I slow the retrieve, I'm still working the fly at my rod tip, but it's more a methodical kind of up and down, just kind of a up and down, a lazy, not necessarily an escape style, but more of a food-based thing where it's just like up and down, up and down, and just so that would be a vertical jig. Mm -hmm. And basically somewhere in the middle of that is where, like in the fall, once water temps hit 50 degrees, uh, or below, I start lowering that and I do a little bit more of that longer, leaner, you know, kind of methodic, just ooh, just yeah. up and down, kind of dragonish. And so reactionary stuff for me, not that I don't, I always start with it. Even, in, even at 40 degree water, I'll start with a reactionary bite just to see if it'll happen because it's cool. Mm. But if it doesn't, which it very seldom does when you get under 50, and depending on your water, like some of the big tailwaters that, that hover in that 50 world their whole life, it might be 45, you know, where mm-hmm. it drops. But but then it's just like a steelhead. I mean, a steelhead, you know, if you go fish the Dean River in, in July and you've got 67 degree water and you're trying and they're coming, getting them to eat dry flies, well, try that in, you know, late October and when the water temps have dropped. Yeah. just doesn't work as well. No. I mean, they, they're not as likely to, to ascend three feet through the water and eat a dry fly. It's the same thing. You, so, the, so back to the thing, back to the retrieve, when the water temps dry, I just change the rhythm of the fly. Okay. And so colder water, I slow the fly down as, as a rule, but there is no rule. Yep. You know, just, just mix it up. Yeah. Mix but up. do it with a purpose. Do right. it on purpose, not just... Well, you know, have a, have a, yeah. when I see fish come at a fly really, really super fast and, and probably one of the most common questions I get is I have, I had flies coming at it and then they, and they just turned away. Almost always when that happens, it's because you stopped your fly in front of it. And so, and I will ask them, did you, and, and they'll frequently they'll say, I paused it right in front of it so he could eat it. <laughs> well, again, you know, they, yep. Predator prey relationship gazelles don't just stop on the dead of a run and turn around and go, hey, what's up? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah, that's right. hey, my Mr. Lion, what the hell? Yeah. What are you doing? So you just keep, and so yeah, yeah, run, 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 and so you just change. You you watch what's happening, and if you keep seeing that, you change something to try to yeah put them in your favor. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. You know, this is good. And, and thinking the one question I had there just on flies and this goes into like fly design too, but are, and are you changing up the, uh, the size of the fly or are you just changing up colors mainly? Yes. No, no, I change, but well, I go by color first and then, and again, warmer water, bigger fly, maybe reactionary movement where the fish is coming at it fast, keeps me on the faster, bigger, brighter stuff. And then slow retreat or slow, you know, fish comes up and just kind of, whoa, not so much, doesn't want to make the effort. I might slow it. And, and then I'll slow my profile. I'll, I'll uh, shrink my profile down. Okay. I mean, I think profile is as big as anything in the, in the game, to tell you the truth. And that's, I saw that trend going with all these flies. Everything was just big, 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 big. Well, I've caught as many fish over 28 on flies that are basically, I mean, you go like Russ Madden's original circus peanut, my peanut envy, which is a knockoff of Russ's fly. Mm-hmm. Uh, that fly, very, very eelish, very chestnut. I'm sure that's what they eat it for. At least mine, I know it is. And, and then, I mean, it just, but it's small profile. It's not giant profile. And, profile to me boy if you if you're just stuck on a big hairhead you know giant fly thing you're going to have a lot of short days you're going to it's going to be not so fun but yeah. i go through the color and you know so i still let's say i start bright and i start bright and fast and i don't get anything i generally what i'm going to do is i'm going to go right to my next fly is going to be dark and i'm still going to run it pretty fast because I like that reactionary thing. By the time I get to that third or fourth rotation, I'm going to reduce that fly size and I'm going to get it going slow Mm. because I'm going to give them a more food-based 
you know, I, there's reactionary flies and food-based flies. Food-based flies are very seldom bright and shiny. They're more earth tonish mm-hmm. to me. And so if it's a bright and shiny, that's a reactionary, you know, shad stuff. That, you know, shad kills is different, but it's still the shad. And, but that's a little different if you've got a kill. That's a pretty unique situation, and not many people get that gotcha. luxury to have those. Okay. Cool. No, that's uh, that really clarifies. So, yeah, I was thinking I want to talk a little bit about um, fly design, and it kind of goes into your YouTube channel, which you know is, is a good mm-hmm. one out there. And and you mentioned one name, the Peanut MV, and there's also uh, the the tits up, and there's got. So I guess I got one question for you. Um, on this the, would be the number one question uh, this, I said earlier. This is the number. This is the number one. <laughs> so so just to clarify the error, is is are you a porn star on your side side gig? <laughs> I needed the money. It was the 70s. Okay. Uh, <laughs> how do you come up with those names? Yeah, that, uh, I'm going to, I think I'm going to stop doing that. That was fun while it was happening, but now everybody's doing it. So it's, oh, so really? Is it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, now every fly out there's got some, and I get blamed for some of the, uh, for all of them, really. But, uh, <laughs> gotcha. It started out, well, probably too much Ted Nugent's what started it out for me. <laughs> but, uh, it started out as kind of a joke, and I did it with a. I, I mentioned Walt Grau earlier. Walt's one of my all-time heroes in fishing. The guy is just an incredible. I mean, he's the guy. I think that if you go back in time, you'll see some sooner or later somebody write a book about this guy. That he's the one that started this whole spay craze. Uh, he taught a lot of the guys that are now really popular doing videos back in the '80s up in Alaska, but. He also is one of the most unique and gifted tires I've ever met. And when I told you we used to swing for steelhead mm-hmm. back, I mean, these guys are beating me up. And I designed the first switch rod for Powell in 1984, actually 1983. So we were doing it back then. Mm-hmm. And uh, Sage had its first spay rod, I think, in 90 or 91. But Walt was the first guy that we would we were trying to – copy the hot and tots and different lures these guys would catch on fall steelhead and walt too cheap to buy a keel hook bent one of his own i still have the fly and he was trying to do a fire tiger hot and tot and he bent this hook and stacked four colors of, of bucktail on it to make it look the orange yellow green and I, I don't remember if it worked. And he was also one of the first guys I ever saw use Flashaboo in it. And he had Flashaboo in it, which yeah, very, it, that was so new back then. Huh. And I'm not even sure it was Flashaboo, but it was something like that. But anyway, fast forward, you know, 10 years. And I'm trying to tie Joe Brooks Platinum Blonde. These these sexual names were around long before. Okay you and I were alive and you know, there was the honey blonde and the platinum blonde and there were other flies like that back in mostly in the salt water. Uh-huh. And I just couldn't tie. If you look in trout, uh, the book trout, you'll see that in his, uh, fly section, you'll see these huge bucktails and I just couldn't tie them Well, I just didn't look as clean as the ones in the book. And I knew I wanted that big profile and I took a keel hook, which is a, they don't make them. I just came out with a new one kind of like it. It's called the belly bumper. And that one, it's kind of like the keel hook. It's got that long bend, but it, the keel allowed you to put stacks of hair on the hook. And I didn't realize I'd copied Walt until, man, I think the, it had been a long time since I'd seen the fly. And I opened a fly box and I saw that fly. I'm like, oh my God, I stole this fly. <laughs> and so... But anyway, he, I, I put it out and I showed this buddy of mine, Ray Schmidt, uh, who's a very famous Michigan fisherman, uh, guide outfitter. He's now a rep for, uh, TFO, but Ray was, you know, he's one of my good buddies and he said, yeah, it's called, it's a blonde. It's a stacked blonde. He goes, you'll never get that through. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I remind, I remind him of it all the time. It was a huge hit. Yeah, that was your was <laughs> that, that that was your first big one. Yeah, well, that was the first. The Zoo Cougar was the first big. Oh yeah. But the first one with the with the names and the the Zoo Cougar had nothing to do. Bob named that, but 
the stack bomb was the first one that had one of those names and it just kind of made a stir. Yeah. And then the TNA came out and it just, it just got people talk and they, it was funny, right? It yep. wasn't supposed to be, no. uh, yeah. you know, and then of course the sex dungeon might've crossed the, the limit a little bit there, but let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. I want to announce a special offer from Ascent Fly Fishing. Ascent has a special holiday event going called Fishmas with 25 to 75% off all flies in select categories during the 12 days of Fishmas. There are still a few days left, so head over to get your holiday special today. Follow Ascent on Facebook and Instagram for special deals each day. I also want to touch briefly just on Ascent if you haven't heard about them yet. One of their flagship products is the custom fly box selection for each unique stream that you fish. They have this nerdy dug, uh, bug database that helps them easily choose the best flies for the condition during the time when you want to fish. It's really cool, uh, uh, really cool deal they put together, so you need to check this out. You can go to uh, ascentflyfishing.com and check out this and the 12 Days of Fishmas. So head over and get started today. That's A-S-C-E-N-T flyfishing.com. We are also brought to you by The Gray Drake, who produces a high-quality vintage fly wallet and boxes. Their motto is progress through tradition, respect through stewardship. The fly wallets are handmade in the USA with sustainable cork. These fly boxes are naturally self-healing, which basically means you, you can put a small little tiny midge or a huge stone fly and the box um, recovers every time so it, it doesn't wear out. They have a couple of cool products um, in the wallet category, including their Ho River uh, double storage wallet. And uh, you'll definitely be proud of these uh, these wallets when you check them out. I have one of my own and definitely know from personal experience, I really love the old fly wallets that my, my dad has. And I always love looking at those and putting in flies. And I remember even my grandpa, my, looking at my grandpa's that my head passed down to my dad. And there's something about these fly wallets that just brings that, you know, that traditional vintage feel back to you. So the Great Drake definitely has that same style going with their wallets. And um, that classic feel is what you get. So right now head over to the Great Drake and they'll be donating, uh, donating a portion of proceeds um, from all sales at the end of the year to Wild Steelheaders United to help defend remaining wild steelhead. Head over to thegraydrake.com uh, to get started today. That's T-H-E-G-R-E-Y drake.com. Okay, back to the show. So did you ever, did you ever get, you know, I mean, from fly fishing, you know, obviously it was a mostly a male dominated sport at, at some point. Did you, did you get any uh, kind of blowback on, on those names from anywhere? No. And, and definitely not from gals. It was, uh, the gals seemed to have a lot better sense of humor than some of the uppity. Oh, yeah. uh, when I got blowback, it was always from some very proper guy who wasn't really into the whole streamer gig anyway. and was still trying to hold on to yeah. the sparse gray hackle. And the, <laughs> uh, it was just, you know, yeah. that I had turned this into some, I turned this I, I've had many people tell me that I single-handedly have turned this sport into a very close to bass fishing in a bunch of bubbas. I said, well, first of all, I like bass fishermen, and second of yep. all, I think that attitude does more than anything. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I, there's been a few blogs out there. I've uh, seen a few posts up. Well, there was one in particular where the guy went absolutely crazy <laughs> on me being a some sort of psychopath sure. and he listed off all the flies and that's why i said it's not it's no fun anymore it's just not and all the flies he listed were charlie cravens oh yeah in particular he that's didn't funny. like the two-bit hooker uh, <laughs> and he a... goes on and just massacres charlie was probably <laughs> laughing the whole time at home going oh gillop's getting his ass kicked over this thing that's cool and it, he named i can't remember which the other one was but he's named he names charlie's flies right yeah which are great flies and <laughs> and really good names, right? But this guy went off and he just uh, just assaults me to no end, and never once mentioned one of my. Flies. That is awesome. No, it's the, uh, <laughs> I, I, I love the uh, the haters out there because you, you know 
I think uh, it's a good thing. The more haters you have, probably the better you're doing. Because it, it means you're trying to mix it up a little bit. Well, at least they keep it interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so for the record, then you are you are not a porn star. You just uh, come up with those names to keep things. I didn't uh, say I wasn't. I oh, just okay. Said it was the seven. All right. So, all right. So there you go. So we'll, we'll leave that open then. <laughs> but uh, okay. So yeah. I mean, I've got obviously. Um, I still got the most. I still got the seventy stash. I was gonna say. I thought I saw something on there when I was doing a little research of you, like in some like uh, bodybuilding buff uh, photo or something. Is that? Was oh, there that, was like, that era too. But, okay, that was. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yes. Uh, cool. Does so, that make you a porn star? Uh, well, I don't know. It, it depends on what uh, what you have going, but <laughs> <laughs> let's not go there. All right. Yeah. Let's let's keep it on fishing. I I tend to <laughs> I tend to uh, go off a tangent. In fact, I interviewed uh, uh, John Gearock uh, recently in uh, episode. Uh, Oh, I think it was 47, and I got some blowback from that. People were like, "What the hell were you doing? There's there, you didn't talk enough about fly fishing." You know, and I just got in a conversation with, with John. It was just about everything. And, like, I, you know, I had negative comments from that. Like, people wanted to hear more about fly fishing. So, I don't know. I mean, I, with, uh, with, with Girak, I was kind of interested in hearing about his writing as well, you know. I was going to say, he's a, that, that guy is a story that never ends. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I'd much rather hear about the other stories. <laughs> totally, totally. Well, I'm, I'm uh, sitting here. I had a, a whole list of questions, and I've only scratched off two of them. So we're, uh, this is good. This is good though. I think, uh, we can maybe, maybe next year we'll, we'll get you on again, but, um, I've got some other stuff I want to dig into. Go ahead. Uh, um, so one of them, I guess just on fly design, you've got a ton of stuff, your YouTube channel. I've watched a bunch of the videos I hear from people all the time and it's just a great resource. What would you say when you think of streamers is, um, I mean, I'm sure you have lots of stuff there for streamers, but what, what makes good, like a good fly design would just generally again for streamers. The, the first thing, it's a great question. And the, and the, the first one is realize how your fly is going. This is the number one, realize how you're going to retrieve your fly. And you do not get to, you, it, depending on how you, if you're a swing guy, all right, it's going to do one thing. Then you can put it in a little tube with the fan on it and show it doing its thing. But for the most part, the way we fish our flies, it's a start-stop. And so when you design your fly, remember how you're going to retrieve it. You know, you'll see these videos where you'll see the fly just for endlessly swimming. Well, surely you understand that some guy's got it on a spinning rod or he's trolling it to, shit, to video it, right? And you don't get to do that. So the first thing you have to realize is your, your retrieve is either, regardless of the style, if you shy of swinging, so if you're a swing guy, that's different. But if you're going to double hand burn it, if you're going to jerk strip it, if you're going to jig it, if you're going to strictly just pull the rope and, you know, just pull on the line, remember it's going to start and stop. And so build that into your fly. Knowing that, realize that the fly's head is stalls and its tail. Something has to make this fly move. So I like, personally, I like things that stall the head slightly and continues the tail to move at you. So it gets a little whip, you know, put a little whip in that thing. Uh, you know, we could go on for hours about this, but my yeah. personal belief is, is that the wavelength that creates, which is a Hertz wavelength, and it's somewhere between that 15 and 23 wavelength, which is to, the, to, to make it very common, very easy to understand. That is when, a, like when you see a minnow, gets distortion when you're watching it like you spook a little yeah. rainbow or something he takes off and he he kind of loses its shape to you that's some or if you've ever had one like a little one they do that super wiggle right when mm -hmm. they're just like oh my god they went off <laughs> this thing that's that that's that distressed wavelength that's 15 to 23 wavelength which is what the fish targets that's the thing that makes the fish go Oh, there's a big fly swimming by me. Well, it's not moving. It's, you know, looks like shit. It's not doing anything. And then there here comes this next one that's got this super wiggle to it. And that's creating that wavelength. They say that a trout can detect that Hertz wavelength 100 yards upstream, 300 hmm. yards downstream. Wow. And if you've ever snagged a little fish, if you pay attention, people act like it's this anomaly that, oh, my God, I had a big fish eat my little fish. That's what they do all day. All night, that's what they do. And so if you watch around when you got one of those little fish, like you snag one a little, like especially when I'm nymph fishing, I'll, be, I'll snag one, you know, I get it, 
in the side and will start doing that thing. If you pay attention around you, you'll see a big brown sitting there. It happens instantly. But so first thing I'm looking at is understand how it's going to get retrieved. Second, build S swim into it so it does that Hertz wavelength. And then a couple of generalities are realizing that the predator, the fish that you're hunting, is an ambush fish. He's looking from the bottom up, right? Make sure you put a reflective value of some sort in the belly, at least. And even in my dark flies, I'll put, you know, some sort of reflective, even though it's black on black. Yeah. Not all of them, but it's just something to think about, right? Your fish is getting triggered, and so you're trying to build a lot of trigger points into your fly. First and foremost, obviously, is swim. It's just make the fish swim. I see it's like the difference between the game changer and the feather changer. People talk, I've never seen anybody catch fish on a game changer. I'm sure they have. But the feather changer is a whole different world. That fly swims instantly. Hmm. The, the more, the, the kind of heavier, denser flies like that fly, or some of the, uh, for another one is some of the, the saltwater patterns that used a lot of the heavier uh, nylons and different uh, antrons that just were so coarse. Like I'm trying to think of big fly fiber was hmm. not that one. It was another one, but it was a little too coarse. Yep. And unless you had some like troll in it or something, I couldn't make it swim. It, my fly would look straight in the water. Right. I would try really hard and I couldn't get it. Versus is, like using when, marabou or something like that. Yeah, marabou. That's it. I like solely things. I like things that like the, you know, flies like the TNA, which, uh, uh, or the, the, the TNA bunkers, all those. They're all marabou by They're like, you know, they're just Palmer marabou and they just immediately hit the water and swim. Yep. And then when the, 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 a lot of the flies that look super accurate to me don't, I, I mean, the first ones I saw before I saw the game changer, I saw this, this guy named uh, Staten Klein had the home records and he sent me hundreds of these things, man, they look just like a Rapala, just <laughs> like one, right? I mean, they were so accurate. He had this way he trimmed things with razors and, and these jigs that he built and man, they were just incredible, but I couldn't get him to hunt. Hmm. I take that same fly and do it out of marabou, boom. Yeah. It's just like, it's swimming, right? It's going. And, I, and, I, and I, you know, Blaine's, I said the game changer uses a comic. So there's a, he's a great fly tire. I mean, he's an incredibly yeah. gifted fly tire. But the, when, I, when I'm looking for a fly, if I'm a guy that's going to burn them double hand, I wouldn't mind those heavier flies. If I'm doing it from a, a boat or on foot, I need the fly to swim immediately mm. upon as soon as it hits the water, and that's where I like like the feather changers or gotcha. the TNA bunkers or any of those things that are marabouy. So I, I like things with soul in them personally. That's just they got yep. a little bit of movement. Right, you know, that's for me. No, it's cool. And so you don't necessarily have to have a an articulated fly to to have a good streamer fly. No, not necessarily. Yeah. I mean, it always it always adds another element of that S. You know that it's that whip to the tail that creates that wavelength to the fish. And so the articulation obviously is going to help that. Otherwise, you're kind of stuck to the, to the whip of the material. You know, either your tail, uh, a deceiver-style tail, or your marabou. Uh, bucktail, I think, will do it. Bucktail, if it's long enough. I'm still a huge fan of traditional bucktails. Yeah. And, I mean, the stack blonde is obviously one of them, but regular old-fashioned uh, bucktails and feather wings. I still fish them. I fish them a little bigger, but you know, the, the tricolored bucktail from the East coast is the first time I saw it. Uh, I, I will, I love those flies. Yeah. So, you know, the three, three and a half inches. Yeah. And they're just a different, like you said, uh, a bucktail with a little bit stiffer fibers might be better say out of a boat or is that kind of the situation where you might, well, not a bucktail so much cause it's so whippy, but, uh, as long as you tie them, you know, bucktails don't, yeah, from a boat where you, you get a little longer retrieve, if that's what you mean. But uh, bucktail proper, tied properly, will still swim like a – Oh, okay. It still gets plenty of kick. It's just some of the some of the, the, the synthetic things out there. You know, none of this stuff is made for us. I mean, people like to think this is all, this is all some other product that we are – harvesting for us, you know, trying to make it do. And some of them are just a little too stiff. I mean, for my liking, that's just, but that's me. There's, there's so many guys out there that have their style 
you know, the, they've got their flies that they like to do one way or the other. And, but you asked me what I think, and right. that's just, you yeah. know, for me, I like the, I like the fly. Bucktail is really soft in the tail, carries enough weight that I still think it can produce a, the wavelength, probably not one that could be transmitted 200 yards, but uh, deceiver tails for sure. Mm-hmm. You know, I love deceiver tail stuff. Uh, I like marabou and uh, man, I, I put marabou in virtually everything I tie. Yeah. It's yeah. just, it's that it moves when you're not moving it. And I remember back in the sixties, there was this, uh, in the back outdoor life or whatever, there was this fly called the marabou. I'm not even sure it's called the marabou minnow, but it was something like that. And that the guy had the greatest line ever banned in seven states <laughs> because of its effectiveness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. I was like, shit, everybody I knew was dying to fly. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. Well, that's part of the I, – I, I had a, a couple other questions here on thinking about more on the design and rods and stuff like that. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Hopefully we'll be able to jump into that. I did have one that – and maybe some people are going to kind of hate me for this because it's going away from the fishing a little bit. But it's just thinking about, you know, like if you had to think of your most – the 50 most flu- influential people – in fly fishing or streamers. I think we talked about this off air sort of thing, but I mean, there's that article that just came out and I think one of the magazines that, that you have written in and it was like the 50 most influential people. And I can't remember, but I don't think you, you mean were, the one I, the one I was an editor at large in for 10 years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I don't 20. think, I don't think you were on that list. <laughs> No, you weren't on that list. I don't think and, I, I didn't suck up to the right guy. No, well, as I say, uh, the, uh, the lot of the people that were some of the people I know were people that probably learned from you because they're younger people uh, and, and they're streamer people. So, what, what's your take on? And, I, and I'm getting more to like the ego thing, which you've talked a lot about in fly fishing and stuff like that. I mean, because you have a pretty big. I don't know if you have a big uh, ego, but you have a big uh, personality in, in the fly fishing space. What's your take on on all of it? And, and where do you think we're at now with everything? Well, I hope I have that good following because I don't have that giant ass ego. But, <laughs> uh, uh, well, I don't. I mean, that whole thing, <clears throat> that particular article, I thought was kind of funny. It's it's a uh, it's like anything else. You need to be buddies with some. Some of them are really accurate. Some of them I couldn't believe. Uh, I don't think publishers should be included in the influential stuff like that. Right. It, it should be the people. I mean. Uh, Jimmy Teeny, guys like that. I mean, there was, there's been so many guys, Joe Brooks. And yep. I mean, I was, I, you know, lefty, obviously, you know, whatever it's who it's a who's who's okay. of buddies. And I think they even tried to preface that with, you know, some people want to agree with it and I didn't with all of them, but I was happy with a lot of them, yep. but you know, and I got, Oh my God, did I get feedback on that? You should oh, see you some did. of the mail I got. Oh, I'll never talk to these guys. No way. Down. It's just like, <laughs> Settle down, Jesus. Nobody's writing history out of that stuff. No. But, no. you know, for me, watching it right now, it's a love-hate. The social media thing's a love-hate for me. I, I mean, I personally think that you're getting, you get a little bit of the ego thing when guys get a bunch of, they get a bunch of uh, likes or whatever, yep. you know, you got people following them. Or, right. You know, I mean, whatever, if that. That's if that it. strokes you, but if, I, I try to, I try to keep it in check with that. I truly think it does more good than bad. Yeah. And in, in, in two or three realms, one in particular is the fly tying. I have said, I've had a fly shop since 79 and I have said every day of my life, fly tying materials are the biggest waste of retail space on the planet <laughs> until social media. And I had fly tying stuff in my shops all my life because you're supposed to, but mostly it was so I could go get stuff off the shelf and not have to order it. <laughs> and But you could never make money on it. But social media has made, if it can be cool, fly tying is cool. Yep. And it has made such a boom. Now, conversely, I hate what it's done for certain rivers because people have to post up where they fish. And that part really, you know, that's just a problem in that you really, really wish that people would find their water on their own. And, you know, there's always been that love, hate, but the social media, but, you know, you just got to go both sides of it. You look at it and you say a river that's not loved isn't loved. And, you know, you've got to have the more people that are out there, which is really 
hard to swallow, but if nobody fished, you know, if nobody fished the Madison River, it'd be really easy for some idiot to put a mine up at the top yep. of it yep. and crush it. And, and, or, you know, there's just all these places where you can't have it both ways. No. You cannot have the river to yourself. It's 2018. You can't. And, and if you want it, hike, get away, yep. and then don't post your damn picture <laughs> about it where you were. But so from the ego perspective, I mean, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, I see people, I, I, I see people post up a fish picture or this or that. And, and who is this guy? You know, all the guys, all the guys that work for me are, you know, I think Johnny's the oldest one. He's 37, I think. And, mm-hmm. They, you know, they all love it. They, they get on there. They all like to bitch about it, but they all are on oh, it. Yeah. So they all love it. <laughs> yeah, it, what, it, what it is in social is, you said, I mean, it's the instant gratification. It's that uh, that, yeah. that hit of dopamine that people love to just turn on and be like, oh, you know, oh, I got, exactly. I got another like, you know, and it's, and that's why yeah. those, that's why these companies, they're, they're almost evil. They're so powerful because they know exactly what they're doing. Exactly. And I, I mean, and I'd be a liar if I didn't say, I didn't sit and look at them. I mean, those yep. guys, go, I'm like, oh, go this guy's fish. But to think that that or some article some guy does is what creates history would be, you know, that yeah. there's still going to be people posting private water stocked fish the rest of your life over 28. He's not going to change. To me, you you know, as far as I think what you were getting at, as far as the, the, that article pissed me off, yeah. I, not really. I, don't, I didn't really put much no. credence in it. But the guys who are the guys who are in, who have done things that contributed, they did it for, you know, the right, maybe they didn't, maybe they did it for their own ego. Maybe right. I, a lot of us would like to say, well, I, there's, I don't, uh, there's no ego in that bullshit. Oh, yeah. Everybody's got ego. You don't work your ass off and hope nobody ever recognizes it, no. obviously, no. but you can go about it right. But the guys who are going to, the posting up a picture isn't going to make you famous. Mm-mm. You know, no. it might for a minute or two, it's yeah. what you give back to this thing is what's going to, you know, when you don't have to back up to anything, when you can look somebody in the eye and say, yeah, I did that and I hope it helped you out. Yeah. I mean, I finish virtually every YouTube, I hope it helps you out. Because I mean, mm-hmm. I hope the more people that fish, the more people that are successful fishing. You know, when I grew up, <clears throat> nobody shared anything. Like you go to those seminars back in the 70s with these guys that were so famous and you'd ask especially if you're a kid it's like oh, get away from me kid <laughs> i mean <Jeez. laughs> everybody had like secrets right wow they didn't have any damn secrets they just wanted you to think they had a secret they're, yeah. they're, you know there's oh, yeah. i guarantee you the best angler on earth no one's ever heard of and i don't know who he is either but he's yeah. out there just crushing it hoping nobody ever finds out what he does <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right no I, she. I, yeah totally yeah. i think no you're getting exa- exactly what i was trying to get at is that uh you know as far as you know just who who were maybe that was one of the things who who is the who are some of the most influential people and you've mentioned a num- number of them i mean obviously you're one of those people when it comes to streamers and a lot of things um and is there anybody else you might note who was part of the streamer game that you haven't already uh, talked about here you know there, it's coming on now it's, it's such a new thing I mean, I did mention, you know, there, there are, there's a lot of guys out there. I mean, uh, Russ Madden, you know, he's one that I, uh, Russ and I, Richie Strolis, and, and there's just, there's a, there's a bunch. bunch of them. There's a bunch of new guys. I mean, look down the white, uh, there's a bunch of guys down, Alex Lufkus, he was down and kind of got those guys started down there. And it's all, it's growing in the last decade so quickly that, I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of great tires, uh, you know. Personally, for me, it's pretty hard for me to look at somebody that wasn't a guide that made an influence because I just don't. Simply tying a fly doesn't cut it, you know. Mm-hmm. Making making people catch fish, and, and that's why, for me, to as a guide, you know, most of my life, it's the it, a lot of people can go out and fish. But can you help other people? Can you design a fly that makes somebody that's not as good as you yeah. catch fish on it? Right. And that's the, that's, I didn't even mention that. I mean, that's how you get, when my flies come out, no one's ever seen my flies. Nothing ever's come off my vice went to production. Hmm. It goes, and then we fish it for a year. 
the guides fish it with clients. And if it works for everybody, it's a good fly, right? Gotcha. And so, but, you know, and, and I don't want to leave somebody out. There's a lot of oh, them. Yeah. I mean, there's, you got your little circle. I mean, <clears throat> there's guys that I don't think should be in that circle that maybe are. Mm-hmm. But because it's like anything, people jumped on the bandwagon and we're, suddenly they're going to, you know, that's going to be their forte. But that's, it is what it is. That's just life. But, yep. uh, you know, there's there's a bunch of them. And, and frankly, uh, it seems like daily... I mean, not daily, but at least every couple of weeks, somebody introduces themselves via social media and, you know, shows me their flies and shows me, tells me how they're fishing and what they're doing. I'm like, wow, that's a great idea, mm-hmm. you know? And I think one of the biggest problems people have in this is letting new kids into the fold. And that's the beauty of the social media thing is that they've got a plat. We, John Randolph and I, John Randolph was the editor of Fly Fisherman Forever. Oh, yeah. And John and I used to fish, to, I think I guided John the first time in 1983. And he and I were pretty good friends. And we used to, we used to have these little meetings, especially when I moved out here because he liked to fish the Madison. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> when he, we would say, how do we get kids into this sport? And I said, it's simple, John, hire kids. <laughs> These kids nowadays, you can meet, I, I could introduce you within 100 miles of me, kids that are under 30 years old that have fished around the world five times. Some of them own lodges in oh, Chile, yeah. been guiding 250 to 300 days a year since they were 17 years old. Yeah. You don't think that's the best? That's, I mean, everywhere I go, people go, oh, you're the best in the world. And <laughs> how would you know that, first of all? Right. You know, and we are fished together. No, I says, well, well, how the hell do you make such a ridiculous statement? Totally. I said, I can guarantee you who's the best in the world is some kid that's 26 years old that you've never heard of who has just quietly learned everything. That's the thing. Everything's out there for these guys and girls. Yep. I mean, all the knowledge, you can see anything you want to know, and they're so good. And that's, the, that's really the difference between when I grew up when I grew up, man, you just you had to assimilate this stuff slowly, reading books and bad pictures and trying to learn to tie. And man, now I, I meet these kids that are 25 years old, and I'm like, oh my god, this kid's unbelievable, right? That's sweet. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, it, it is great, and it's what we always said we wanted. But I think a lot of the guys my age and older uh, had a little trouble with not being the superstar. It's like, dude, that's <laughs> Nobody gets to be the king no. forever. No, well, and no. that's part of the thing, I think. And that's actually what I'm trying to do with this show. That's what's so cool to hear you talk about it because, I mean, I'm trying to – one of the things is connecting those dots from the older school to the new school. And I, I talk mm-hmm. to people every day that are young, like you said, young kids, even 13, 12 that are out there posting on, you know, on Instagram, sure. you know, the whole spectrum. So I, I'm just trying to – you know, the fact that we're talking here, somebody's going to listen to this that's brand new to it and they're going to get some ideas and, you know, and they're going to connect the dots yeah. to you. And so, yeah, I love it. I, in fact, I have uh, Ray Montoya, who's a guy that I, I interviewed, sure. uh, Oliver White, who's coming up, and he mentioned Ray Montoya, this guy that lives in Iran and fishes mm-hmm. over there for you know just the most remote thing you can imagine. But he's been over there for 20 years, and he, he's got it dialed in. I sent him a message on somewhere. I've tracked him down on social, and he's like, sure, I'll come on your show and talk about fishing you know, over here. So it is pretty amazing. Neat. Yeah, it is cool. I mean, and in, in reality, that I mean – that's the whole, that's the beauty of it. Cause we've always said any club I've, I've spoke all over the world. I mean, you know, it's nothing for me to do 30 or 50 speakings a year hmm. and every club, every, everything says, how do we get the youth involved? This is, you know, in the old days I'd say, well, quit, quit blocking them, you know, listen to them. First of all, help them mm-hmm. nowadays. You don't have to, they're involved and it's, and it's what we all said we wanted and now, and now it's like I said, it's, it's, it's the love hate relationship we all wanted. And, and as, from my perspective, as a professional, you know, as a writer, whatever it is that I am, that was the whole idea was that you were going to help people. Right. So for someone like me to be pissed off, that there's too many people fishing, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. think about it. It's like oh, the yeah. dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Well, there are all these damn kids out there. It's just, you son of a bitch. That's what we all said. Exactly. We were. We were all damn kids once. That's Why right. don't you shut up and enjoy <laughs> it? 
maybe you learn something from them. Guys are always saying, I want to go fish with you. I'm like, no, you don't. You want to go with Johnny. Yeah, yeah, nice, nice. <laughs> He's younger, taller, <laughs> faster. It's nature. Yeah. You don't get to be... You don't get to keep it forever, if no. you ever had it, for that matter. That's cool. You know? That's cool. So you're still, well, I guess you're still guiding. Uh, are, you, are you still getting a few days no. out there? No. No, I don't guide. Okay, yeah. I, I mean, I, I will on occasion. Yeah. As my buddy Mike Craig said to me once, you need to know when to stick a fork in and it's done. <laughs> yeah. And I... Uh, That's what you... <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I am so... Uh, I'm so grateful for, I mean, I guided for 30, 43 years, I think, and I had a great time, but at this point in the industry or my business, it's, I, I would rather have my day to go fish and, yeah. and test flies. Although this summer for the first time in a couple of years, I guided a few days and, uh, I had a blast, hmm. but I'm afraid that if I got out there and did it too much now, I would miss my i just don't get the time on the water i used to and so yeah when i get it i want to go and do it and uh not worry about having a bad day because i don't care if i get skunked no that's fine with me no that's good but i sure don't want you to get skunked under my when you're in my boat (laughs) yeah yeah no i no that's all good stuff i uh i did want to touch base um uh, just to wrap up the rod because i had one question on you know talked mm-hmm. we talked a lot about fly design and, and fish and stuff like that but as far as the the rod i know you've designed your own rods when you think again somebody mm-hmm. that's just getting out there for streamers what what do they need for a rod what do they need for a line and then maybe just the leader setup just to kind of bring that full circle well the obviously i would say the saint croix bank robber because i designed it mm-hmm. but there are a lot of rods out there and the thing the thing is first and foremost on the rods is I don't like uh, really fast rods because especially when you're running a a sinking line, and by fast, I mean just flat stiff. That does not make a good streamer rod. The the St. Croix, the rods I designed, have a the the middle flexes, so it opens your loop up a little bit. But on rod, there are so many great rods now. I mean, it's, it's really hard not to be able to find a good rod in virtually any price point and mm. virtually any company, really. Yeah. But for me personally, I don't like rods that are stiff from head to toe. I want the middle to flex a little bit. I like the tip to be fast and the butt to be fast because that allows me to I animate my flies with my rod. I don't strip flies with my hand. I don't pull the line to make my fly move. I do everything by the rod tip. So I like a fast tip, but I want the middle to open up and to, there's that ridiculous dog, <laughs> nice. get in here. And so I like the middle to open up the loop a little bit. Mm-hmm. I personally like sinking lines, um, and my lines are 30-foot heads. I designed lines for airflow, Okay. and I did in the old days, I did for SA. I did, started with Jimmy Teeny, yep. uh, and then I went with Jimmy's... Uh, to SA and when Orvis bought SA I left and went to hmm. uh Airflow who I was trying to Tim Ray Jeff who runs Airflow USA yep. who's a really good friend of mine and I really wanted to go with Tim from the get go because I, I like that Airflow technology the the polyurethane uh cores or coatings I mean mm-hmm. and they just work better for the for the tungsten for the sinking lines and so i I fish floating lines too i'm I'm mostly i would say 95 percent of the time i fish a 200 or 250 grain uh sinking line Mm -hmm. and so because i do really short casts like i said it's it's really rare for me to throw 30 feet Hmm. i mean maybe on a really giant river if i for whatever reason i can't read it I prefer to get in tighter. Uh, I've got a living mantra, cast less, stalk more. (laughs) Uh, I I don't like long casting flies and, and hoping, you know, I, I I say it in the book many times, hunt your fly. Don't hope your fly, read your water, figure out where the damn fish are, get the fly to them and, and have it be doing what it's supposed to do when it's supposed to be there. Yeah. 
Don't just hope it crossed by them and think because you got a big fly that the damn thing's going to come out and blow it up. Are you breaking up the river when you look at it? You say you look upstream. Are you breaking up into like little ten or twenty foot chunks of area to fish? Always. Yeah. Always. Yep. Okay. And from a boat too. I mean, yeah. I tell people constantly in the boat. You know, I'm always, <clears throat> you know, fish that water. Did you did you see it? Look downstream before you get to it. Don't get a hold of it. You know, understand what that water's doing. And once you start reading it and breaking it down, then you're more accurate. I mean, you're, you're more likely to be able to absolutely target a big fish, which I said in the very beginning. I don't think anybody can target a big fish. Too many, too many variables where something can go wrong. One bad cast, right? When the one fish all day is right where it's supposed to be and a 12 inch eats it, you know, three feet before it gets there, <laughs> you're done. Done, right? Piece yeah. of moss. You didn't see the yeah. piece of moss. Boom, on the fly. Huh. Well, there's your shot. That's it. Now you got another day to go until you see another fish like that. Huh. And so there's not, and so the more you understand your water and can break it down, the better. And that's, and to the line that we were speaking about, I like lines that they care. The, the sinking lines are as much about carrying the bigger flies, which of, of today, as it is anything. It allows you to, accurately deliver a fly better than it does on a floating line you just have more control over the sinking lines because they weigh more than the, the fly mm. and so that's the reason i do it and my leaders you asked about that yeah. <clears throat> my leaders are relatively short and simple on a sinking line my basic kind of go-to leader is 12 inches of 20 pound maxima green with 18 to 36 inches of 12 pound maxima green tip it mm-hmm. period uh i seldom go over four foot on my leaders yep. on a floating line i'll go seven to nines uh you know zero x I, I i seldom go below zero x on a extruded leader they're not looking at that they're just yeah. it's so repetitive the casting is so repetitive when if, if i'm walking i'm casting and i only retrieve if i cast 30 feet i only retrieve 10 maybe 15. If I'm in the boat, I try to hit every three foot of everything I'm looking at. And so it's a lot and a lot of casting. And so, uh, the sinking lines do that really well on a floating end of that. Um, because the, the lines, it's just, it's harder to throw them, but on foot and that, that's something else is from a boat. I fish pretty much all seven weights. But on foot, I frequently fish six weights because I'm casting shorter, and that six weight is going to bend and load quicker for easier for mm-hmm. me. And so I tend to, you know, as a foot angler, I tend to run sixes a little Oops. bit more. And a, and a nine foot rod. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I like nines. Okay. And so, I mean, I just I keep it pretty simple. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Um, yeah, Kelly, I uh, definitely uh, we're not going to get to all these questions, obviously, but I don't know. Do you have a little more time for a little rapid fire round? Sure. Okay, cool. Yeah, maybe we can just zip through a few of these questions and just give a little short take on it. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then that'll take us to the end and we can he- head on to our next thing. But, uh, so, yeah, I was going to talk, you know, your YouTube channel is awesome, I mentioned before. What would you say for somebody, you. somebody that's never watched your YouTube channel, how would you describe it in, in kind of a few words or, or simply? Uh, <laughs> I can't tell you my name in a few words. Okay, all right. uh, you just describe. <laughs> Actually, it's just... they're they're in they're tongue in cheek on the the how to things, the quick ones. They're supposed to be very rudimentary and fun, but the fly tying. I was told by all the experts to keep those really short and never exceed eight minutes. And I did just the opposite because I have history in this, and I have failed so many times. Uh, I, you cannot be a good tire without failure. Yeah. And so what I do on my videos is I go through them and tell you my failures and my successes so you don't do it also. And so the, the fly time ones are pretty in-depth. Yeah. Maybe to ad nauseum. No. But uh, the, the other ones are designed to be short, quick, and easy tips. Okay. Okay. So, but 
we're trying to help. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah, no, you're doing a good job. No, it's great. So Thank I've you. got the uh, the two, two, and two. There's uh, the the uh, the first thing of this. What I ask is just you know if you could give me. You've talked a bunch of tips and th- stuff, but maybe your top two tips that you might give somebody. We could talk about streamer, just fly fishing in general. Hunt the water, don't hope it for sure. Mm-hmm. Meaning, break your water. Look at it and understand the water and what it's doing. Uh, and the, I guess the other one would be kind of a two-part. Keep it simple. You know, don't overthink it because it, there's not as much to it as there's no mystery. There's no secret fly. Okay. You know, if you fit, you can fish the wrong fly right and catch fish, but you can't fish the right fly wrong and catch fish. Okay. And so keep it simple yep. and, and, and use the resource, man. There is, God, yeah. I, I, I go on these, there are so many YouTube things out there. I swear to God, I, I think they, uh, it must be a sign of the times because I go on people. I don't even like their guys and go and watch them and think, wow, I wish I did that that way. I'm going to learn something from huh. people. I don't even no, I shouldn't say don't like. I mean, just maybe I'm not a big decorative fly guy. I love Pat Cohen stuff. I love all these guys stuff, but I don't like to do it, right? But I still go on and watch it because I can learn something from every one of them. Yep. And so use the resource. That's cool. Yeah, no, those are great. And uh, keeping on the two, two, and two thing, uh, uh, you mentioned one there on just resources, but for your flies, if you had to pick two flies to, to fish till the end of time, what, what would they be? Um. Uh, Whew. Zoo cougar and a sex dungeon. Okay, and, and a streamer. And, on a nymph, yeah. it would be a hare's there and a simple caddis. Like, and on a dry fly, it would be a found link and a missing link. Oh, okay. All right, and yeah, I'll make a note. I haven't made note, but um, at uh, wetflyswing dot com slash fifty two, I'll have all the show notes. And uh, actually, this I think is uh, yeah, this will be kind of the annual of the year. Uh, celebration, I guess, episode as well, because 52 weeks is makes cool. a year. But uh, so I'll have some other stuff, uh, price and bonus stuff coming out. But um, and then the second thing, or the third part of that two, two, and two is the resources. Uh, you mentioned YouTube. Is are there a couple of good resources that maybe aren't your own that you would uh, recommend for people? Uh, well, I was actually saying, and, and before I was saying, to use the resources, not just mine, but everybody's. Um, fish with people that don't fish like you. Hmm. It's uh, mm-hmm. I fish with a lot of gear guys. Yeah, uh, I, I learn a lot of stuff from everybody. Yep. But the resource wise, you know, there's still a lot of. Just because some of these books are old doesn't mean they're bad. And I mean, you know, books are cool. Gary LaFontaine's books should be in everybody's. Man, the guy was something. Yeah. And you know, there's a there's a lot of. There's a lot. There's just so much out there. Yeah. And, you know, totally. get involved. Okay. And I had uh, uh, Troy Pierce uh, in the Facebook group uh, mention he, he had a question for you. He wanted to know when you're uh, the second book. I think you mentioned when that when that's going to be out. Oh, man. I wish I could get asking that. I've lost that book three times the virus. Oh. I backed it up and drove my car into my, when I moved, I drove my trailer hitch into the computer Hit Damn. the disc and the hard drive. Oh. I sent it off. It's it's at, it's currently was supposed to be out this May. I sent it to have uh, my buddy Jerry Dennis and his wife Gail are floating it and doing everything with their company. Uh, we had another we had another screw up on my part, and so now it is. We, I'm actually as soon as I get off the phone, I'll be finishing up naming pictures. Uh, we're hoping in two months, maybe three. Okay. All right. Perfect. It's at the, it's at the, it's out of my hands now and they're just trying to fix up all my, uh, yeah. I write with a crayon, you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> another another question I was thinking that I had to ask you this one because you got I've I've watched a number of your fly time videos, but do you have and this isn't an easy question for a lot of people, but maybe a, a tip or two, a fly tying tip that might help somebody who's maybe starting out or or, or tied a little bit but struggles at it. <clears throat> the first tip would be to practice tying, and that does not mean tying a fly. And when I do my seminars, uh, I ask people constantly, like we do a lot of hair work, right? And I say, how many of you guys hate, gals hate, uh, how, how many of you love fly tying or uh, hair tying? 
Nobody's yeah. hand goes up. How many of you hate it? Everybody's hand goes <laughs> up. Is it, how many of you have ever practiced it? And they all look at you. I says, I mean, without trying to tie a hook, a fly. Right. Try practice your craft. You know, I was a fighter for a long time, and I, I never once saw somebody jump into the ring without learning how to throw a jab. You, you, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't. You don't just jump into the tie. Everybody wants to know how to tie the fly. If, and once you've tied for a little while, you probably got the basics down. The, the, my other tip would be remember that n- oh, no more than three wraps is ever, you never get to put a fourth wrap on a material. Hmm. That means you secure your, sh- your stuff properly mm-hmm. and you do it with the right amount of tension. With not, you, You'll see people tie, they'll put one, two, three, it should be set, and they'll go, oh, one, two, three, and they'll throw three more right behind it. Yep. That's just per- per- superfluous shit. It doesn't help a thing. It makes the fly soft. It doesn't tight. But try practicing. Buy a $6 piece of hair and do nothing but spin that stuff. Mm-hmm. Put it on, take it off. Put it on, take it off. Remember that? What was that movie, Karate Kid? Oh, yeah. Wax, wax on, on, wax, wax off. off. Wax on, wax off. Yeah. Learn to do. That's why you do katas. That's why you do drills on heavy bags and huh. so, you know different things. You do things because you learn how to do it. Yeah. And, bef- and so, if you the best fly tying tip is learn to set tails. Hmm. Learn mm-hmm. to set the tail. All right. Now learn to set the collar. Just collar. Nothing else. Mm-hmm. And it'll become very easy. Perfect. Perfect. And they could, uh, yeah, and I'll have a link to your, your channel there. People can check out or just search you up. But um, One more tip yeah. on, on, on hair in particular. You have to have good hair. Get a relationship with whomever you buy your materials from and realize not hair is not a synthetic. Hair is a natural product, and it's all different. Learn to select your hair. It will make a huge difference because a lot of people listen to this are streamer people Mm -hmm. and a lot of people are going to work with hair. And if you're a dry fly person, you're going to go out and you're going to to tie a little Comparadon wings or something like that. Even more important that you understand the difference of the hairs and then get a relationship. Just because you order it online from somebody doesn't mean they're picking it out for you. Make make a relationship with somebody. Hmm. Yeah, that's a killer tip. Cool, and um, and this is kind of a maybe one that's out there a little bit. Um, uh, well, I guess just thinking of you know, I ask this occasionally to some of my folks on the the older side. You're not, you're not old by any stretch. Are, how how old are you? By, sixty. Uh, sixty. Yeah. So you're you're definitely still a young. Like, but you're still a young. I'm buck. like one foot in it, baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. There's uh, well, I tell you what, I, I interviewed uh, Frank Moore. Who was you? Probably you've heard of him. Okay, probably. I'm not quite Frank Moore's age. No, but the, the point there is that I, I did that in, uh, interview in person and shook his hand, and I'll tell you, he's 95, and he doesn't mm-hmm. seem like he, he doesn't seem like he's 95. Still put the grip on you, didn't he? Oh yeah, yeah. He put the, he put the smack <laughs> down on. It. The, the other question I had there though for you is the the fighter. So I'm not going to have time to talk about this, but. I'm going to have to get you back on next year sometime because I want to hear this story. Like, are we talking boxing or like karate? Or? I did. Yeah, both. A lot of that. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, it was fun. That's, that's good. <clears throat> good yeah. times. Good. Uh, okay. Then, <laughs> yeah, go we ahead. Can go from the, we can go from the porn star to the bodybuilder to that part of it. Totally, yeah. This, be, is, <laughs> <laughs> this is going to this is gonna be uh, lots, of, uh, lots of stuff to work on. But uh, So I'll just stay with the uh, the fishing again, fishing up the, finishing this rapid fire thing. The, the most common misnomer in fly fishing, I don't, that's kind of a general open question, but does anything come to your mind? Yeah. The distance casting helps you fish. Oh, yeah. And that'll get me more shit. More people are going to write in. It's been the biggest facade. It's been the biggest lie in our industry since I can remember. And <clears throat> learn to fish, you know, stock more, cast less. Yep. The better, you know... And not we're, we're taking away space, so all the guys are pissed off right now that want to yell and scream at me. Uh, that spay fishing is a blast. I love to spay fish, but that's a that's a different style. And if so, if but for the general trout angler, which is what we're talking about, learn to read your water and don't be as don't be as obsessed with. 40 foot is in eternity, and I don't care how you're fishing. If it's a dry fly, you can't read the water that far out. And if it's a nymph, you're totally wasting your time. 
uh, you might as, be, might as well be, you know, center pinning at that point. Huh. But <clears throat> yeah. even with a streamer, I mean, read your water, you know, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't know how to cast long. It just means that don't, don't think that the fish is out of your reach. He's, they're not. Yep. Okay. They're right there. Okay, cool. And and if you had, uh, we're just about there, but if you had one, um, uh, if you think back at your, you're 60 now, so if you look at your 25-year-old self, do you have a, a word of advice you might you might tell that that, uh, that kid back there? <laughs> it is about fishing. Uh, uh, no, this could, this is this is about anything. This, this could be anything. <laughs> Find out whose wife's whose. No, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I would say listen. You know, yeah. Listen, my my listening abilities were really poor. Uh, <clears throat> I I would say listen, and, and and just just so I'm not that grumpy old piece of shit. <laughs> just so you know. I would say, I don't know, maybe it's just in my shop or, or, or the fly shops, but I got to tell you, I see more people in that age, guys and gals coming in my shop in that 25 range that are all ears, oh, yeah. all, all questions, all, and it is the coolest thing on huh. earth for me. And yeah. I mean, I just think it's the greatest thing because I would have, in my era, in my generation, I'd have walked in all puffed up like, you know, thinking I was somebody and I wouldn't have listened maybe. Yep. And I, if I could change something in life, it would be to go back and to hit myself and say, just shut up and listen. Mm. Uh, but listen, you know, for a reason, yep. Don't, you know, ask questions. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's the difference today than when I was a kid, I, I might ask a question, but I would never question the answer today. Mm. I have people walk in constantly especially the young people and and i keep saying guys it's it's just an axiom yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. there's a lot of gals up there i mean i get a lot of gals that come in that are cool. <clears throat> mostly because i'm such a stud but, <laughs> but secondarily but they're 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 really good right and mm-hmm. they're and the gals i mean it it doesn't matter guy or gal if ask the question but don't be afraid to say what about this and I and I don't have that. I have. I mean, they they ask me questions. It's it's an all day thing, and and it's really neat to me. I think it's. I mean, uh, I just find it fascinating because, like I said earlier, our whole life we've all supposedly we've all wanted to see more youth in our sport. Now we got it. So <laughs> embrace it. You know. Yeah. Yep. No, that's awesome. All right, Kelly. Well, uh, yeah, like you like you mentioned earlier, we could talk for another two hours, but I'll I'll, I'll try to respect a little bit of your time uh, and let you get out no of here. But, but before you before I let you go, maybe you can talk in the next uh, the next six to twelve months. What anything we can expect from you? Well, I guess you have the book. That's one big thing. Well, the book will be out in the spring sometime. Uh, I'm kind of cutting my speaking tour back this year, so I'm not going to be out as much as normal. Mostly because we're going to. The success of that YouTube thing uh, has been absolutely astronomical. And so I decided that in lieu of being on the road as much as I usually I'm gone pretty much from now until May, I'm gone every weekend of the year and decided to go just to put a little bit more effort into the YouTube thing. And so that we don't run out. Generally, we don't do those in the summer because, you know, when May hits, we, oh, yeah. it's a, it's crazy here for the, you know, until November. Sure. And so we run out. <clears throat> so we're going to try to have a backlog of stuff for the summer. And so we don't run out and, uh, and take advantage of that Q and a, if anybody that's on there that, t- cause you know, when you do, when you've done a couple hundred of those things, yeah. it, you run out of ideas. Yep. And we have a Q&A section where we send out, you know, ask people for their questions. And that is, for mm-hmm. me, my favorite thing. How do they do. find, how would somebody find that Q&A, get on they that can, list? They just send an email to the slide in, you know, at slidein.com or go on the YouTube and there's a comment thing. Okay. Uh, and, and I don't, you know, they'll find it, it, yeah. it, you know, if they get to us, but if they send it in, you know, and then we send them a hat and a box of flies if we use your questions, oh, nice. kind of cool. And, but... It, for me, it's so, and it's crazy because we'll, we'll say we're going to, you know, Q&A week and we'll get a hundred responses 
and you'll get 40 of them will be the same question. Yeah. And we've never been able to figure out what did I say some point last month or this or that, that, hmm. <laughs> that everybody has the same question. And it'll have nothing to do that we can, it won't pertain to anything we've shot. That we, we can't figure it out. So, but what it means is there's a lot of people that are thinking yep. the same thing about something out there. And that is the coolest thing for me ever. That is cool. I mean, I just, I just really love, yep. you know, because I get to, I get to, and I don't get to, you know, a lot of times on a really good YouTube thing, I, I, you know, you can get just hundreds of comments yeah, and you can't answer them all. So you try to do, you try every week, we try to do something. There's no possible way to answer all this mm. email. And, but when they come in a collective body like that, at least you can answer the question. Gotcha. And so that's pretty cool for what, us. What but, does you mentioned the success of the channel? What what does that look like for you? And and maybe in the future too. What does that if you're doubling up a little bit on the YouTube channel? You just uh, you're seeing. I mean, obviously lots of comments. What's your um, you know what is your ultimate goal with that channel? Well, the goal is to keep you know just to build the, to build that library to to keep it growing and growing. And just as a resource, you know, it's today's book. It's it's the modern book. Here, you know, it's just. People log them, and, you know, for us, it's a great revenue builder as far as people shopping online from, a, you know, oh, that sure. don't necessarily know us. Um, yep. But that's, you know, it's just, for me, it's an easier way than getting on a plane and going and doing a seminar, and which I love to do, too. And it's, it's one of the dilemmas I've got doing it because I love going out on the road mm -hmm. and shaking hands and saying hi to people and actually getting to say hi. and. Yep talk to them and so it's 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 a neat thing but it's just it it's such a great avenue for advertising the lodge and and us and you know what we do hmm. and it just it, and it's and it's such a positive you just can't imagine it, 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 i it, mean for for every one idiot that falls in say, and hates on you you've yeah. got hundreds others you know that that's that's what i mean that's what's so cool to hear you say how positive it is because yeah you hear about these stories of of how much youtube is this 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 dark hate. haters club yeah haters club oh, but, yeah. but you see you see a lot uh definitely way more positive stuff yeah well i've got my haters i mean yeah. and 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 it's and and frankly it's more often than that because i said something that i don't it's usually a spay thing oh really <laughs> Yeah, the guys really get but it's like anything, you know, if you're spay, if you're Tenkara, you're in Tenkara. And if you're spay, you're spay and it's like oh. and I do both. I and I and I just laugh at it because I I, I do both and I I love it. I love all kinds of fishing. Yeah. And so but at any rate, uh the haters keep it interesting and in reality, it's more fun to watch the people that are on there respond to the haters than it is for. I don't no. respond to them. That's right. I no. just flat. I just flat don't. Oh, yeah. I just. It's like no, I'm yeah. not running down that rat hole with you. No. You go ahead and, you know, come into the shop and tell me what you got. I, I always liken it to if you and I were sitting in my living room and yep. you were looking at at my album and you said that's a shit picture and if <laughs> you do that. A, we could just finish it right there. We'd figure out what was wrong, right? Exactly. But now you got all these warriors out there just they're badasses on their typing writers. I know. Or keyboards, I mean. It's pretty <laughs> funny. It, it, no, but I it, hear you. you know what? It, in some ways it's funny. Yeah. But it does that. It, it, it used to just cut me to the bone. I would be like, oh my God, they hate us. They hate us. No, that's not them. It's this guy. Johnny knows every one of them by name. And it's like, and uh, he lives to hate you. I said, oh, who I gave him a job. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. That's good stuff. All right. All right, Kelly. Well, uh, yeah, I guess if people want to find you, they can go to uh, uh, slidein.com. Yep. Okay. And uh, yeah, yep, just, that'll get us. I'll get you there. All right. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll let you get out of here, but just want to thank you again for all the resources. We covered a lot of stuff, but, uh, you know, definitely di didn't get it all. I'll try to provide some links in the show notes. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, man, uh, thanks again for we, spending the time. We can. We can do it again. I'd love to. All right, Kelly. Good time. All right, thanks, thanks a lot. Buddy. All right, man. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we cover, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 52. And if you want to support the show, head over to wetflyswing.com slash Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And find out how to get bonus content and a way to help support the show and keep the movement going. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon and hope to see you online or on the river. 
Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.